Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining Exosome Diagnostics for this webinar entitled The Power of Exosome's Diagnostic Applications and Beyond. My name is Carla Gagne, and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Johan Skog. Dr. Skog is the Chief Scientific Officer and Co-Founder of Exosome Diagnostics. He is also a world-renowned expert in the field of exosomes, having been one of the first scientists to discover exosomes and realize their potential on disease detection and management. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Skog. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much, Carla. So I'm uh, thrilled to speak to you today, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about exosomes in general. So <clears throat> this is a little bit different than I normally do it. So normally I speak to you about exosomes for diagnostics, but today I wanted to cover more of a broader field for everyone to get sort of introduced to the exosome field in general. So today I will talk a little bit about exosomes in general, the, the dynamics of exosomes and how they are important for the physiological <clears throat> function of, of human beings. And also uh, exosomes as mediators of infectious diseases, as well as therapeutics and diagnostics. So this was all sort of inspired after we got together with a team of exosome scientists to present to Bill Gates about the the, the broader field of exosomes in general. And we thought this is actually something that would be interesting to, to also broadcast throughout the company and, and talk a little bit broader about exosomes. And I think um, this session was about three hours. I'm gonna condense that down to um, about 40 minutes instead. So I hope you can uh, bear with me during that time. So <clears throat> um, we know that exosomes are budding off from plasma membranes of the cell. And the classical way of exosome release is through the endosomal pathways, as you see here to the left. And I just wanna remind everyone, there's a lot of um, confusion in the field around exosomes because everyone uses different terms. So they're called exosomes, they're called microvesicles, microparticles, oncosomes, prostosomes, you name it. They have so many names and people tend to like to classify these vesicles into different buckets. Um, today, it's actually not possible. We don't have a marker that significantly um, um, tells you from the, what origin the vesicle is coming from. We think that vesicles, uh, the content of vesicles are more defined of where they bud off from the cell rather than what mechanism it comes off from the cell. So here you see an inward budding of of an endosome, and that will package material into the exosome uh, from that region of the cell. As you know, there's a gradient within the cell where you have different types of molecules in different locations of the cell. So some RNA species, for example, are more abundant at the plasma membrane. Some proteins are more abundant at the plasma membrane. So they would be more abundant in the vesicles that are budding at that uh, phase. But remember, uh, even if you have budding at the plasma membrane from that component rather than the endosome, um, cells aren't always perfectly spherical and you can actually have budding from the plasma membrane further inside the cell but are still directly at the plasma membrane. So we know that exosomes are part of this intercellular communication system. So typically when you read a textbook about intercellular communication, we talk we talk about the endocrine uh, signaling, paracrine, autocrine, neuronal or contact dependent signaling. However, these exosomes actually rewrite these textbooks now because vesicles or these exosomes can actually function with all of these. So basically a released vesicle can function as a paracrine molecule, can also function more as an endocrine uh, molecule that works at a distance, and they can also be con mediate contact dependent uh, signaling. So these exosomes are small. However, they are also very large. It depends on what your frame of reference is. So they're really small in the way that, <clears throat> they're actually smaller than the wavelength of light. So the wavelength of light is typically 400 to 700 nanometers. An exosome is typically between 30 to 150 or 30 to 200 nanometer in diameter. So they're larger than molecules, the secreted molecules, but they're much smaller than a cell. 
And since the diameter of the, the exosome is so much smaller than the cell, the, the um, volume is significantly smaller as well. And you, to give you sort of a frame of reference, you can fit over a thousand exosomes on the cross section of a hair. That's sort of the, 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 the size of these. But since these vesicles are coming as a package, they are actually unique in the way they mediate intercellular signaling. So if you think about secreted molecules from a cell, they are the, the concentration of those molecules rapidly becomes diluted with a distance from the cell. So if you look at this plot here, you can see the function of the concentration, or the concentration as a function of the distance from the cell. So the further you get away from the cell, the more diluted the signal becomes. And that's illustrated here. So if you have a cell releasing these single secreted proteins or secreted molecules, it can have a very high concentration right around the cell, but they become quickly diluted the further they go. However, when you look at the exosome component, they don't because they come as a package. So even if you have um, an exosomes working as an endocrine molecule, it actually comes as a package with many, many different types, so hundreds if not thousands of different molecules in one package. And that enables you to have an enhanced signaling and also multi-dimensional signaling molecule because it can signal not dependent on one interaction, but two or three, four, or even a hundred different interactions from one vesicles. And you can have an exosome carrying basically component from an entire biochemical pathway. So that makes them very different in the way they, they, they signal compared to traditional secreted molecules. So where do these go? So <clears throat> exosomes are, of course, circulating in your blood. Exosomes exist in every biofluid of the body. So urine, CSF, blood, saliva, uh, ashitis fluid, um, you name it. There, there's exosomes everywhere. And in the blood in particular, we know that there's some, there's some sort of release of exosomes from the blood vessels into the tissue. However, it's significantly enhanced if you have microvascular, loss of microvascular integrity. That happens typically if you have an inflammatory response or if you have a cancer growing. So cancers are known to have a very leaky microvasculature and that leads to um, exosomes being sort of enriched or they accumulate in these lesions, well, lesions of inflammations or lesions of, of, of cancers. And you can think about how these are then actually uh, uh, participating in the intercellular signaling in the case of inflammation and, and cancer in the body. So but what do these exosomes do on a cellular level? Well, um, there's a lot of different cellular mechanisms that, that exosomes are part of. So they're part of a protein quality control system, for example, where a uh, couple of examples here, the transferrin receptor removal from maturing reticulocytes. So when um, a reticulocyte matures, it no longer needs the transferrin receptor. And one way of actually get rid of that is to release it through an exosome. Exosomes can also modulate the extracellular matrix. So they've been uh, shown to be involved in bone formation and cardiovascular calcification, blood clotting. And in the case of neurodegenerative diseases, they actually carry these prion proteins, alpha-synuclein, amyloid beta, et cetera, that are actually part of this, this uh, the, the neurodegenerative uh, pathway. So for the intercellular signaling, you have two different sort of mechanisms. You have the receptor engagement, that is often used for immunosuppression. I'll talk a little bit about that. Growth factor signaling, et cetera. You also have functional delivery, where exosomes can deliver a functional RNA molecule or a functional protein. And it's shown that that is, is playing a role in sperm maturation. It plays a role in memory and learning and, 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 and a, a, a wide host of different uh, functions in the body. I'll, I'll uh, explain this slide here. This is basically one example of this 
protein quality control system, where it's shown that uh, um, when you have a, an egg, um, the sperm actually um, binds to the egg through a receptor called Juno. And you only want one sperm to sort of enter the egg. And one very fast and efficient way to actually to, to help that happen is that they, the egg will release the Juno, the sperm receptor, in exosomes. So basically, you have two options to downregulate a receptor. You can e either internalize it and degrade it, with the risk that when you do that internalization, something else comes into the cell. Anything that's bound to that receptor can actually be taken into the cell. So a more fast and efficient way to get rid of things is actually just to cut the cord and release the, release the, the receptor through um, a vesicle. So when you go to a higher level, sort of what physiological processes um, are implicated with this? One, <clears throat> I, I, I'm gonna name only four of them. Where, and then the trickster, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the, the trickster here, the cancer immunosuppression using exosomes is something that has become very relevant in the recent um, months and years because um, when you think about cancer growing, um, we have an Im immune response that actually normally can remove tumors and can kill tumors. However, um, the body has this um, checkpoint, immunological checkpoint, to actually prevent immune cells to go, uh, go crazy and actually react against normal processes in the body. So the body has this checkpoint system called the PD-1, PD-L1 um, uh, checkpoint system is one of them. And tumor cells have adopted that. So basically they can overexpress um, PD-L1 to blunt the immune response so that the, tumor, the, the, the immune response can no longer um, uh, kill the tumor. So there are now therapeutic approaches to block these um, checkpoints with checkpoint inhibitors, PD-L1 inhibitors or PD-1 inhibitors. And, and those seem to function really well. Uh, however, tumor cells seem to have another sort of ace up to the sleeves because these PD-L1 molecules can also be secreted in these exosomes. And one single tumor cell can release over 20,000 of these exosomes in one day. And they are loaded with PDL1, almost like a decoy, so that 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 the, the, the tumor cell can't actually see it. Exosomes are also part of memory and learning. So um, I, I often say we're only part human. So half of our genome is actually transposons and transposable elements and jumping genes. And a part of those jumping genes are actually endogenous retroviruses. So we're, we actually have a lot of these viral sequences in us. And recently it became known that, that ARC, ARC is a memory gene. ARC is a very crucial memory gene that we all need to actually form memories. And that we didn't understand the function of ARC and how it operates. But now we've learned that ARC is actually part of this virus that utilizes the exosome secretion pathway to spread. And basically, um, uh, this shows you how the ARC protein can package the ARC mRNA in something that looks like a virus particle, and then the exosomes take up that and deliver it to the target cell. So basically, that's a, an intrinsic pathway of forming uh, a new memory. Exosomes are also part of proteinopathies and, and Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, where we know that formation of these exosomes are actually happening through something called higher order oligomerization. So whenever a, a protein aggregates form like that, they, they have a selective sort of incorporation in these exosomes. So prion protein is one typical example where <clears throat> normal prion proteins are shown to exist on exosomes. However, if you have the faulty version of the prion protein, like the prion protein scrapie, that's sort of the, the aggregation that happens in variants Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or, or uh, mad cow disease, 
these molecules then increasingly accumulate in these exosomes that can actually be released and transported as almost like a virus particle from one cell to the other, other and seed new aggregations at new pl places. Um, another one is uh, that ticks use exosomes in, as a part of their, their, uh, the, uh, the way to blunt the immune response. So when a tick actually uh, bites, it releases exosomes that are immunosuppressive, which is good for the tick. But it also helps transmit flavi flaviviruses. So these flaviviruses that cause tick-borne diseases can actually be transported inside these exosomes um, and infect the host cell. <clears throat> I wanted to show you sort of an illustration of, of exosomes and how you can monitor these. So this was a, a really nice imaging experiment <clears throat> done by a group in the Netherlands where they took CD63 molecules, which is a, a classical molecule that's been incorporated inside uh, exos or in, in exosomes, and they fused it with fluorine which is a pH dependent fluorescence. So basically it doesn't glow when the exosome is inside the cell because the pH is at 5.5. As soon as this multivesicular body fuses to the plasma membrane and releases the exosomes to the surrounding, there will be a flash of light. And that's um, shown here. Hopefully this video will actually highlight that. This is a cell and and uh, a cancer cell. And every time you see a flash, it's actually a multivesicular body releasing uh, a bunch of vesicles. Often there's 20, 30, 50, or even 100 exosomes released at once every time you see a flash. So it's a quite abundant event. So this, hap this happens actually in real time. And you can see how these go goes off. And this is only monitoring the vesicles that are released through this endosomal pathway. On top of that, you've got vesicles being released through uh, direct budding at the plasma membrane. Another way of visualizing exosomes and how they, they function in vivo is, is can be done uh, using zebra, zebrafish. In this case, it was a zebrafish embryo where um, they made the, the yolk sac uh, fluorescing green. So only this organ is green. Everything else shouldn't have any green fluorescence. Uh, any green fluorescence outside of this region here is mediated through exosomal transport. And now we're zooming in over here in this region of the embryo. This is a blood vessel going this way. And here's a blood vessel going that way. And you can see the green dots here. You can actually see how the green dots accumulates here in the tissue. Um, as the, the red dye gets bleached here, you'll see more and more how these green exosomes, you can't see the individual exosomes because they're too small. However, you see in this green shimmer um, of, of, of individual particles, and once they aggregate, you see these dots, the green dots. Uh, you can even see how some cell types take up these exosomes in the circulation. But it's a really fascinating um, video that illustrates how abundant these exosomes are and how they're taken up in tissue where they can actually mediate its function. So exosomes can transfer RNA, but also proteins between different cell types. And we know that exosomes from different cell types do have different tropisms. So when someone asks you, where does the exosome go? Well, it is actually slightly different depending on the source of the, the exosomes. And the abundance of exosomes depend on also the abundance of the tissue that released it. So I like to illustrate that with this, this schematic image of sort of the weight of the different tissues. The brain is one and a half kilograms, the lung is 2.2 kilograms, uh, blood is actually five liters. And blood is, so, so blood is clearly, the blood cells are clearly the, the main source of exosomes in circulation just because of the, 
the, the abundance of it. Um, fat tissue is also very interesting because depending on person, you can have very varied amounts of fat. <laughs> and, and of course, depending on how much you have, you get more of fat-derived exosomes carrying molecules from those fat cells that can actually be part of intercellular signaling and affect how, we, uh, how the rest of the body functions. Um, this is an example where they show that you can actually monitor activity of different fat tissues, so brown fat tissue, as well as subcutaneous uh, fat tissue. And you can monitor how much uh, or is, is coming out the cir circulation from different, different areas. So um, moving on to the infectious diseases. So this is a fascinating field because I come from the field of virology <clears throat> and, and I've always sort of um, been fascinated by how viruses spread in the body. Um, classically, when you think about viruses, they are either non-enveloped, they're naked capsid viruses, or they're enveloped viruses, which means they have a membrane around them. And typical examples of an enveloped virus is HIV. Typical example of a non-enveloped virus are some of these enteroviruses and Kuntzaki and, and even rhinoviruses that, that, that uh, are released from cells. And that's been sort of the textbook of how viruses exist in the body. However, we recently learned that that is not the case. This model is actually completely blurred now because all of these viruses can also be released inside exosomes. And we call them EV cloaked viruses. And they can be transmitted to others via bodily secretion. So they can be transferred, they can be uh, transmitted through uh, extracellular vesicles in blood, in respiratory secretions, uh, stool, breast milk. If you look in a stool sample, for example, um, over half of the rotaviruses and noroviruses are found inside these exosomes, which is incredibly um, uh, fascinating because that affects how we, we look at, at, at these viruses and also how we prevent spread of these, these, these viruses. Another aspect, when a, a virus is packaged inside these ex exosomes, they're not packaged one by one. They're actually packaged um, with a bunch of them in every vesicle. And that has enormous um, implications. You can imagine, it's basically like a super virus. Instead of having now one single virus infecting the cell, you have a vesicle carrying 10 or 15 viruses into that cell at one time. And this is true for all viruses that we, that's been looked at, rotavirus, norovirus, poliovirus, Coxsackie virus, et cetera. They're all packaged in this way. And <clears throat> this illustrates sort of the, the, um, the importance of, of this. So if you take poliovirus and you have a cell culture, and you try to infect them, you infect them with the same number of viruses, but um, one is the EV cloaked viruses and one is free viruses. You would think that this one causes more infection, right? Because now you have the ability to infect more cells than this, because there's only two of them here, right? However, when you, that is not what, what, what's been seen. So when these single viruses enters these cells, they're not as efficient in creating infection because the cell has a lot of host mechanisms to block virus replication. So they can actually suppress virus replication to some extent. However, when these viruses enter as a group, they produce an enormous amount of, of viruses and, and replicate faster. So when you monitor the infectability, basically the, the EV cloaked viruses generate more progeny and a more efficient infection than free viruses. Um, this is true in vivo as well, where actually mice were, were fed either EV cloaked viruses or free viruses. And in every case, you had a more efficient infection with the EV cloaked virus, even though there are 
this is the same number of viruses, but they will be in, in, in mass, basically, in, in the EV fraction. Um, there's also another important aspect when you're looking at viruses that are packaged into the super virus. <laughs> um, when you try to inactivate viruses, often, like in the sewage treatment plants, we use UV. And if you UV treat the vesicle-coated ones, you will inactivate some of these viruses. So, so UV basically cross-links nucleic acids and make it inactive. And, and if you inactivate a fraction of the, the, EV, the viruses in the EVs, it's still able to infect the cells. However, when you UV treat the free viruses, the viruses alone, you reduce the titer enough so that the virus alone is not um, as infectious. So you have to take this into consideration if you if you want to uh, monitor infectivity in, in, in sewage uh, treatment plants, etc. Another aspect of exosomes that uh, that is 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 growing uh, quickly now is you to use exosomes therapeutically, and uh, there are typically four classes of therapeutic exosomes. One is native exosomes. It's basically isolating exosomes as they are and use them therapeutically. Typically, it's stem cell exosomes. Or you can endogenously engineer them, or ex exogenously engineer them, or you can create hybrid exosomes. So I'll talk a little bit about, about that. So when it comes to native exosomes, they're often used to, for example, for antigen presentation, can be as a vaccine. You can have immune modulation, where you have extracellular vesicles that, that modulate immune suppression. Uh, stem cell exosomes have been very popular to be used in, in trials for tissue repairs, where they've seen that um, uh, instead of using stem cell treatment, uh, you get the same or similar functions by taking the supernatant from the stem cells. So actually using the exosome fraction rather than the cell fraction, because the good effects of the stem cell transplantations are usually not from the cells themselves, but from molecules that are secreted from, from these cells. So exosomes have been shown to be very safe to be used, and that's not surprising because we, we do blood transfusion all the time, right? So in, in every blood transfusion or plasma phoresis that you give, there are billions and billions of exosomes being transferred. However, the efficiency of these treatments aren't that great. Uh, so we think that engineering these exosomes to contain um, targeted molecules will actually improve the eff efficiency. So engineering of exosomes can do a lot of different things. You can engineer them to basically take up proteins, uh, RNA, DNA, viral vectors, or even drugs that are unstable in vivo. So if you have a drug that you know has a great effect in vivo, but, but, or it has a great effect against a cancer cell, for example, but the stability in circulation is very poor. If you put that molecule inside a vesicle, the, the pharmacokinetics, the stability of the molecule uh, changes. Um, so we think that this will actually be a very transformative therapeutic uh, in, in the future where you can actually use these, these uh, um, exosomes to, to transfer a wide variety of different molecules. One uh, topic that I'm very interested in is gene therapy. And we actually, a number of years ago, we published uh, gene therapy vector exosomes. Basically, if you take a virus particle, you remove the content of the virus particle and add your favorite therapeutic gene inside it. You basically have a virus vector that can um, uh, be used for, for gene therapy. However, the problems with gene therapy using virus vectors is that um, they create an immune response. And your immune response create, uh, produces these antibodies that will block uh, uh, uptake of the, the virus vector. And it's very hard to retarget these, these vectors. However, when you put the vector inside an exosome like this, then they're no longer neutralized by the immune response. And they can also infect cells that are normally not infected by the gene therapy vector. 
And that was recently shown in this uh, gene therapy paper where these uh, uh, vexosomes uh, rescued hearing in, so there were mice that, that, that had a genetic defect, so they couldn't hear. However, when they introduced the gene um, using uh, a standard gene therapy vector, it didn't work. When you put the gene therapy vector inside an exosome, it did rescue hearing of these mice. So with that, I'll uh, move into the, the more classical, uh, what you've heard, heard more, more about from, from me in previous talk, and that is the use of exosomes in, in liquid biopsies. <laughs> <laughs> so exosome-based liquid biopsies is, is a growing field, just because, as I told you previously, exosomes are part of the disease process. They're part of this mechanism that, that the, the um, cancer cells are using these to its advantage, for example. And that makes them really interesting biomarkers. And the fact that we can capture all of this content inside these exosomes, so we can monitor the entire RNA transcriptome, the mRNA, the microRNAs, and the non-coding RNAs, is extremely helpful. Uh, remember, not all uh, exosome or exosomes don't carry the entire transcriptome. They're too small to do that. Uh, so every vesicle only has sort of a few RNA molecules, maybe up to 10 kb or so, just because they're too small to package the cell content, basically. However, the the that is compensated by their sheer number. So you never analyze one exosome. You, when, you, when you extract exosomes, you always have billions of them. And when you collect billions of these exosomes, their content reflects the entire RNA transcriptome. But you can also monitor proteins like the MMPs, angiogenic proteins, tumor-specific proteins, and tau, alpha-synuclein, even prime proteins for neurodegenerative diseases. So they're, they're really a, a, a real um, a treasure trove for biomarker molecules. And liquid biopsy today is more targeted to oncology because when you hear liquid biopsies, most people are looking at circulating tumor cells or cell-free DNA. Um, those don't play a role in non-oncology areas such as neurodegenerative diseases. So there's a huge interest in using exosomes to enable liquid biopsies outside of oncology. And here I'm just showing you one example of, of the, the sort of um, excitement in this exosome field where a bunch of papers have shown tau in exosomes and, and amyloid beta in exosomes. And all of these are useful for monitoring of neurodegenerative diseases. So there's a lot of these great papers out there. However, I want to raise a, a sign of caution <laughs> because <clears throat> there's there's a lot of hype in the biomarker space in general. So this has nothing to do with exosomes per se, but but has to do with biomarkers. So we know that the biomarker dilemma today is that most biomarkers that are published in literature, they fail. So if you look in 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 at, at PubMed, for example, you can see that in 2018 there were close to 6,000 papers on exosomes, and there were over a thousand patents on, sorry, uh, on biomarkers, not exosomes. So papers on biomarkers, and over a thousand patents on biomarkers alone in one year. However, if you look at, at um, the number of tests that gets approved every year, it doesn't mirror this at all. So so, so there's some discrepancy uh, in, in, in translating these biomarkers into the real, real biomarkers. And I think most biomarkers fail in validation due to incorrect study design, and they are used in proper methodologies. And one example, going back to the neurodegenerative diseases, for example, where one of the most interesting papers, as far as I'm concerned, turned out to be uh, an artifact due to the isolation methods that they were using. So the isolation method utilized a protein called thromboplastin B that actually contained the, T, the tau and the phosphotau that they were measuring. 
in the analytical readout. So they were basically adding the molecule that they were measuring in the method. So, so it's very important to understand how you design it and how, what methods you're using for the, the, the analytics. You need to properly evaluate the platforms. You need to have a platform that is unaffected by the matrix effects that is highly variable in the, between individuals. You have to optimize the method of choice for the biomarker of choice. So a lot of people ask, what method should I use for the exosome isolation? There's no answer to that because you have to rebut the question to be, what marker are you looking at? Because different markers require different uh, considerations. And every method has pros and cons. So basically the type of biomarker, it's important to understand, are you looking at an RNA molecule? Are you looking at a protein? Are you looking at a sugar, uh, sugar, et cetera? Is the biomarker that you're looking at uniquely found in the exosomes or are they present as a ratio with some of them outside of the exosome? Because with that understanding, you can then develop your isolation method to take care of, of those issues with co-isolating non-vesicle uh, biomarkers. Um, here at Exosome Diagnostics, we're actually really proud of our platform that we've, we've, we've been able to take this all the way through and we have uh, methods that are really um, well validated and characterized and we can do the extractions in a highly reproducible way. And using those methods in the biomarker discovery efforts, that's what makes us different because when you look in literature, a lot of people are using biomarker discovery using one approach that we know is not clinically translatable. And when they find a biomarker using that method and then switch the isolation protocols, that biomarker is no longer valid. So we think it's very important to use the right method uh, throughout the entire process. Another <clears throat> very exciting uh, aspect of exosomes is that you can decipher tissue specific signatures from them. So in a blood sample, you have exosomes coming from a wide variety of tissues and organs here. And in most cases, the majority of exosomes in circulation are not coming from the disease tissue that you're interested in looking at. So that's why you can utilize a depletion method or an enrichment method for the vesicle. So depletion is used if you don't have a positive selection marker. Enrichment is used if you do have a positive selection markers. And that enables you to do these tissue specific analyses. And if you do this appropriately, you can actually do a complete RNA profiling of the exosomal content. And you can do that from any input material. So here at Exosome Diagnostics, we've optimized all the the, the biofluids, the plasma, serum, cerebrospinal fluid, urine, etc., cetera. And a prop, with proper isolation, you can, uh, uh, you can do a library prep that captures all of the RNA transcriptome. So from as little as half a mil of plasma, we can see the same diversity of RNAs as you would from a tissue sample, which you sequence a tissue sample at the same read depth. So we see over 30,000 of the 56,000 genes or up to 17,000 of the 20,000 mRNAs. And in every step of the process, we have controls. We spike in 92 different uh, exogenous controls. So we know that we are reporting out on, on, on valid data and that, that, that um, uh, sensitivity goes down to actual single molecule detection. Um, here's an example that is unusual for the liquid biopsy space in, in the way that it focuses on early cancer. So stage one and stage two cancer. Looking at liquid biopsy using cell-free tumor DNA, there's a lot of progress in late stage cancer, so stage three and stage four, because those have enough circulating copies of the mutation. However, we've shown that Taking a plasma sample from early stage breast cancer patients, in this case, ER positive HER2 negative patients, we're able to differentially um, um, see differential expression in the normals versus the cancer patients in the plasma. And if you take the tissue sample and sequence that, of course, you see differences between the 
cancer tissue and the benign tissue. So an important differentiator here is actually these are not normal controls versus cancer patients. These are actually women that came in with a nodule. And after biopsy of the nodule, half of the patients turned out to, to be a benign process and half of the patients had a, a stage one, stage two cancer. So in this setting, we could differentiate the cancer patients from the, the, the benign processes, but the signatures were not identical. And that's not surprising because when you're looking at the exosomes in plasma, of course, they're coming from a variety of processes. They come from the tumor, the tumor stroma, immune cells, et cetera. So basically it's monitoring the systemic changes to the, the cancer. In some instances, you wanna instead enrich and only look at what changes happen inside the tumor. So that's where the eddy platform comes in, where you, fish out the cancer-specific exosomes using specific markers overexpressed on that particular cancer. That enables you to pull the signal out of the noise, basically, and, and see the RNA signatures and the protein signatures that are coming from the tumor. This is a very fascinating plot <clears throat> that shows you what happened when we pulled out the tumor-specific exosomes. Not only could we differentiate the, the benign patients from the <clears throat> cancer patients, but of the cancer patients that overexpressed this surface marker, um, the, pro the plasma exosomes clustered next to the matched tissue from that patient. So not only could we tell you that you had early stage cancer, but we could tell you what the RNA profile looked inside the tumor by a simple blood sample. And that is a game changer for, for liquid biopsy. So <clears throat> exosomes are complicated molecules or complicated entities because they have so much going uh, uh, for them and a lot of different components associated with them. So they have a bunch of different proteins on the surface. They have a lot of different content. And using machine learning or um, AI to, to basically help you in the, the development phase um, is important because you can actually find combinations that increase the specificity of your marker. So one example is if you pull down tumor-specific vesicles that have this marker only, um, you may not get uh, enough yield or specificity of the marker but if you look at two markers, you know that these two markers are all coming from the same cell. So you're not confounding yourself with, with markers that are overexpressed in, in non-tumor tissues. So to sort of uh, look at how we can utilize machine learning for this process, we, we took one, um, one disease application where we wanted to try it out to see if it actually worked. And that was for bladder cancer using an, a urine, urine exosome sample. So this bionic platform that we have at Exosome can do this biomarker prioritization efforts. So when you think about bladder cancer, for example, the, you could mine the literature, you can search for what's overexpressed in the bladder cancer. However, that's not always relevant in a liquid biopsy sample because you don't know if that marker and that signature is going to be reflected in the liquid biopsy. And there are also other concerns that like um, um, in a urine sample, these men often, or men and women come in with hematuria. So they get blood in the urine. And we, we, we don't want to have a signature that would be confounded by blood in the urine. So with the machine learning approach, we actually found a cancer specific signature that so overexpressed in bladder cancer can be detected in the urine exosomes and shouldn't be affected by blood in the urine, for example. And what was really fascinating is in the first try with this approach, um, we found a, a set of gene markers that actually were completely unaffected by blood in the urine. We tested that with normal urine as well as urine with a little bit of blood to basically urine that, that, that would definitely trigger you to go and see a doctor. 
Um, and, and you can see here that the signature is completely unaffected by the hematuria as the machine learning approach predicted, and that was a, a huge win. So, of course, um, uh, these exosomes can be applied for a variety of things. You can use them for RNA expression profiling. You can use them for mutation analysis. Um, you can use it outside of oncology, etc. You can use it for anything on the planet and beyond, because also even astronauts in space are, are being helped right now for, um, by, by some biomarker approaches uh, using exosomes in biofluids. Um, so I also wanted to cover quickly um, the clinical diagnostics using exosomes, basically where we are today in, in, the, in, in the prostate cancer field, <clears throat> as well as the medical oncology field. So when you think about clinical diagnostics using exosomes, one approach is looking at actionable mutations in circulation that's often done by cell-free tumor DNA. Um, Cell-free tumor DNA is coming from the dying process of the tumor, so cells that die through apoptosis and necrosis. And exosomal RNA is coming from the living part of the tumor because it's a metabolically active process to release these exosomes. So we figured if you combine these approaches, you actually look at two biological processes at once and you get the higher um, pickup rate of your mutation. And we've shown in, 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 in four different papers that you get up to 10 times more copies of the mutation by combining these, this RNA, exosomal RNA plus the cell-free DNA. And that can be helping patients in, 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 in real life. This is, this is actually an example where um, EGFR um, T790M mutations can be detected using cell-free DNA on the Roche-Cobas FDA-approved test. However, they only have a 58% sensitivity at an 80% specificity because there's not enough circulating mutations around on cell-free DNA. When we combine the exosomal RNA with the cell-free DNA, we drive up the sensitivity to 92%. So what that does is that basically using this assay, 42% of patients will not be eligible for the best drug just because they don't have a test that detects it. So having a higher sensitivity enables you to give the right drug to the right patient at the right time. <clears throat> so uh, moving forward, um, the EPI test is basically the the, the world's first commercially available urine-based liquid biopsy using exosome. <clears throat> and I want to touch a little bit about what, what we try to achieve with this test, what, what this test is doing in the clinic today. So the prostate cancer space is a little bit different than many other oncology areas in the way that today uh, PSA is used for screening. And that leads to so because of the, the poor specificity of PSA, there's a lot of men that gets a biopsy that maybe shouldn't have had one because they either find no cancer at all or they find a, an indolent cancer that they're going to live with and not die of. So for that reason, USPTF uh, uh, task force, they, they basically recommended against PSA screening for a while uh, because they found that there was too much harm done by finding uh, these men. Right now, the, the approach is to have a shared decision process. So you utilize PSA uh, and, and you, you, you discuss with your patient if you want to proceed with, with, a, with, a, with a biopsy. Now, uh, EPI is designed to be part of that workflow, where if you have a PSA in the gray zone, basically a PSA between 2 and 10, where PSA does not work, uh, it provides additional information to the clinician and the patient to, to inform them in this decision process. And <clears throat> urine exosomes contain exosomes from the entire urogenital tract. So you've got exosomes from the kidney, exosomes from the bladder, and exosomes from the prostate. However, exosomes from the prostate is not sort of secreted into the bladder. Um, because it's sort of fur further down in the, in, the, in the plumbing system. So 
you don't want a patient to uh, fill up a cup because if you continue to urinate into that cup and you get too much of the urine that was in the bladder, um, you actually dilute your prostate signal with kidney exosomes and bladder exosomes. So by utilizing this first catch system where you urinate, urinate into this funnel, the urine is diverted down into this first catch collection system. The green thing is a float. So as you fill up the first 20 milliliters, it, this one goes up and seals off. And then the urine uh, is diverted out this way into the toilet. With this method, actually we, we, we achieve a sensitivity of 93% and a negative predictive value of 90%. If you define uh, cancer as a Gleason 4 plus 3 instead of a 3 plus 4, uh, the negative predictive value goes up to 96%, which is extremely helpful for, for this decision process. Um, the EPI score itself is actually part of a risk stratification system too, so that the higher the EPI uh, score you have, the higher chance of finding prostate cancer upon the biopsy. So if you have an EPI score of 50, you have around 50% chance of finding prostate cancer upon a biopsy, or aggressive prostate cancer, high-grade prostate cancer upon biopsy. You have about 80% chance of finding any prostate cancer. So with that, I just want to summarize with uh, this exosome platform that I, I really think redefines the new gold standard for liquid biopsy, where it applies to oncology as well as non-oncology and enables you to do high sensitivity mutation analysis as well as RNA transcriptome profiling. And that broadens the field or the scope of work for exosomes to also non-oncology areas. And I also want to highlight some of the future directions where exosomes can go. And I, I want to acknowledge also Sudipto here for giving valuable information in, in, in some of these future directions yeah, to increase sensitivity specificity, uh, uh, utilize and leverage the, the, the importance of multi-analyte tests, so combine combinations of proteins and RNA, and also going beyond cancer, make sure that we um, have a ethnicity and gender balanced uh, biomarker discovery approach, make sure that we develop diagnostics that's relevant for the planet rather than just uh, very small um, um, populations. Uh, and with that, I'll happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Skog. That's a wonderful presentation. We appreciate the attendance and all of the participation, both on the phone and in the room here in Waltham. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and have a great rest of the day. This presentation is now ending.